Good evening. evening. Welcome to Divine Peace. Blessed Monday, Thursday evening to you. I'm going to take care of announcements first. So if you want to turn to page 22. So in keeping with the the feel of this service, uh, at the end, there will be a response back and forth, but no blessing. And then there will be the customary, the stripping of the altar. So any of the ladies of the congregation that would like to and feel comfortable, at the end of the service, after the responsive, just music will be playing. We won't be singing a hymn. Music will play. You can line up here in the center aisle. Items will be handed to you from the altar. You'll walk through this door, make a right, and go through, and there's an empty table, and we'll set the items on that table. You can continue to walk around. Ushers will show you where to go, but it ought to be very clear where to set the items. And then you can come back into worship, and you can sit until the altar is completely stripped. And music will continue to play. You can sit and meditate as long as you want, and then everybody's uh, free to go as they please. You won't be dismissed in any kind of formal way. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Again, on page 22, you can read that. Same instructions. There won't be any announcements, any formal closing, just meditation, stripping of the altar. So, uh, Other than that, everything's printed for you in the worship folder. We'll begin on page 3, joining to sing the opening hymn, hymn 714, The Lamb.
In this Lenten season, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led Him to the cross for our salvation. We have also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of His Spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of His love for us and Jesus, our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, which is the announcement of our release from guilt, the pastor announces the forgiveness we have from God Himself. This announcement by the called servant of Christ is the absolute and unchanging guarantee that all our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name, by the command, and through the completed actions of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other, as Jesus became our servant. We'll join in a responsive confession of sins and assurance of our forgiveness. My son, don't despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Like an earring of gold is the rebuke of the wise to the listening ear. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins, release me from my guilt, and grant me your Holy Spirit to amend my sinful life. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent His Son to die for all. For His sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness to His marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Forgive and to God. May the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. Amen. It's time for prayer, so a reminder, not just to the kids, but the adults too, to stop what you're doing, drop your heads, and fold your hands. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you are not dead, but alive and ruling all things with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading. For tonight is recorded in Exodus chapter 12. This will serve as the sermon text for this evening, and it has the theme, Remember the Lamb. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the tops and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. 
When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt. For there was not a house without someone dead. The word of the Lord. We'll join to speak responsibly the psalm for this evening, Psalm 116. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. New Testament reading is recorded in Hebrews chapter 10. Reminder that through the Lamb, through that one sacrifice, we are free from all of our sins. They are not even remembered. And so then, He encourages us to meet together, to gather, as we are now to encourage each other till that day when the Lamb returns to take us all to heaven. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, He says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then He adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, His body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance of faith that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Says the word of the Lord. I'm joined to sing the next hymn, hymn 748, Lamb of God.
This evening's gospel reading is recorded in Luke chapter 22 here. Jesus gives the disciples, gives to all of us the Lord's Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it for you, they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. But I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. I have told you this often to refer to you, but take it and divide it among you. I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is found in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The band of hymns of number 10, page 506. Oh, bless the house where'er we fall. Service will continue with the sermon. Again, the sermon is based on our Old Testament reading from Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 30. So you can follow along at home. For those of you here, you can follow along in your worship folder. We'll begin with this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When all of you were growing up, I'm sure you got asked the question often, what is your favorite animal? So I'm going to give you a sec to remember what your favorite animal was. Then I'm going to count to three, and we're going to say, not shout, okay? Just say out loud what your favorite animal is. 
Okay. One, two, three. Buffalo. Good. Yeah, buffalo. I love buffalo. My high school mascot, if you ask my wife, love buffalo. But there's plenty of different answers, right? We all have different answers. Or maybe you heard somebody say your same animal. Great. Throughout the Bible, there are many mentions of animals. Yet, God never tells us what his favorite animal is. Of course, there's one particular animal that God often uses to point us to our Savior, Jesus, his dear and beloved Son. But before we get to talk about that animal, we have to talk about another one. In the Garden of Eden, a serpent tempted Adam and Eve. A snake spoke to them, and they listened. They gave in to temptation. They fell into sin. They brought punishment not just on themselves, but the whole world. They brought death into the world and hell. But God was quick in his response to the devil and to Adam and Eve to promise that he would send a Savior, someone to undo everything that had been done in the garden. And we hear that promise in Genesis chapter 3. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, that's a singular offspring, a male offspring, and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It's the first promise of the Savior. And this promise continued down to Noah and then through Noah's son Shem and finally to one of Shem's descendants, Abraham. And God got more specific with his promise to Abraham. We hear about that in Genesis chapter 12. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I, that's God, will curse. And all peoples, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. When God said this to Abraham, Abraham didn't have any kids. Yet he said, I will make you into a great nation. When God said this to Abraham, he was 75 years old. And his wife Sarah was 65. And yet... God made good on his promise. Not right away, though. There's another 25 years. And Abraham and Sarah had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, and God later renamed him Israel. Israel had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, or Israel, and his 12 sons, in order to survive a severe famine, went to live in the land of Egypt. And at first they were welcomed as guests. Pharaoh was happy to have them there, happy to share the abundance. As time went on, Pharaoh, the pharaohs of Egypt forgot. And soon the Israelites were turned into slaves. Century after century they served, not a people, not a free people, but slaves. About 400 years later, God delivered his people through 10 miraculous plagues, revealing that it was only by God's power that they would find deliverance. And in that 10th plague, God uses an animal to show his love for Israel. In that tenth plague, God said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to put to death the firstborn of everyone living in the land of Egypt, unless you sacrifice a lamb or a goat, could have been either one, and then paint its blood on the top and the sides of your door frame. And then I will pass over, which is where we get the term, pass over that house and not put to death the firstborn son. And so God's people, Israel, listen to the command of God. And they put to death an innocent lamb, and they put its blood on the door frames, and God passed over their homes. But the Egyptians, they did not listen. They did not listen to God, and we hear the result of that in our Old Testament reading from Exodus chapter 12. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon 
and, I think oftentimes we forget this, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Not just the Egyptians, but all of their animals. All the firstborn of their animals also died. This is a terrible tragedy for families, but also a terrible burden on the nation. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. It was this plague. It was this final plague that caused Pharaoh to call to Moses and say, Leave! You and your people, get out of Egypt! And God wanted the Israelites to remember this. He wanted them to remember that it was God's power alone that allowed them to be delivered. He knew once they left Egypt, it would be easy for them to be tempted to forget about God. They would be their own people now, no longer slaves, but a free nation. It would be easy for them to trust in themselves and forget that it was God who allowed them to become a people, God that allowed them to grow, God that delivered them. And so God told Moses to tell the Israelites, Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. The instructions about celebrating the Passover. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children, your children, the next generation, when they ask you, what does this mean to you? Tell them. It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Unfortunately, the Israelites did not obey. They did not remember. They did not continue to celebrate the Passover. They did not teach the next generation. Instead, They repeatedly needed God's deliverance because they trusted in themselves. They forgot. They did not remember. And so he had to deliver them over and over and over again because of their sin. And not only because of their sins, but from the nations around them that constantly attacked them. You and I fail God. Just like the Israelites. We fail God by not obeying his commands. We fail God by not remembering all the great things that he's done to save us and continue to bless us with in our lives. And we fail to teach the next generation to remember. Now tonight, we're going to focus on that third point. As with the Israelites, you and I are commanded to teach the next generation. We must teach the next generation about God. We must teach them because they are not conceived with faith. We must teach them because they are not born with understanding about who God is, what they need from God, the true nature of their relationship with God because of their sin. And because they grow up in a world where most people do not love God and do not love each other and are not familiar with Scripture, and in fact, they reject it. We fail the next generation when we do not teach them. When we say it's up to the kids to decide, it's up to the kids to choose what they're going to do, what they're going to believe in, we fail them. See, we understand in all the other aspects of the next generation's lives that we must teach them. We get that we have to teach them how to brush their teeth. I have to be taught that I have to brush my teeth. We have to teach them how to swim. We teach them music. We teach them sports. We teach them manners. We teach them stranger danger. We teach them all kinds of things. The most important thing, the most important thing is to teach them about God. And if you do not teach them, they will learn from other places. A lot of times they learn from cartoons, it seems like. Generation to generation, it seems like cartoons teach, whether it's in a book or a show or a movie. Which brings us back to that whole animal thing. 
when we don't teach our children and we just allow them to be taught by silly, random things like cartoon animals, like what? What's an animal? Like a mouse, let's say. And you allow that to be the thing that teaches, that repeatedly educates, that programs your children. They will remain spiritually lost. They will remain spiritually confused. They will remain in their guilt. They will have all kinds of answers or all kinds of questions, but not the answers. And because they remain all those things, they'll be condemned to hell. You and I fail God. You and I fail the next generation when we do not teach them to remember the great deliverance that God has done for them. When we don't remind them what he taught Israel, that only God can deliver us from our greatest enemies, not just the physical things of this world, but our true enemies, the things that affect us spiritually, the things that will affect us forever. That God alone delivers us from sin and from death and from hell. God used the lamb to show the power of his deliverance. The Passover revealed God's power to deliver Israel from their slavery. But more than that, it pointed ahead to how God would deliver all people, not just Israel, but all people from sin and death. The lives of the Israelites were spared because of the sacrifices of many innocent lambs, which then leads us to what John the Baptist says in the New Testament in John chapter 1. When John the Baptist sees Jesus approaching and he says, Look, the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not the Lamb of God that's going to restore just the Israelites, but the one who will take away the sin of the world. John recognized Jesus as that innocent sacrifice, the Lamb who had now come, who would take away the sins of the whole world, not just Israel. God kept his promise to Adam and Eve that one male offspring would be born. One male offspring would come and he would crush the head of the devil. It was on the cross that Jesus, yes, had his heel. It was struck by the serpent. He died. He was buried three days in the tomb. It stung, but it did not last. The devil only got his heel. Jesus got the devil's head in the resurrection. Just as a side note, if your head gets crushed, you don't survive that. You could survive the heel thing, but you don't survive getting your head crushed. This is what our Savior did. God delivered Israel from Egypt. He delivered them time and time again because of the promises that he had made to Abraham. That Abraham, from your people, will come that one Savior. Abraham, from your people, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Not just the Israelites, not just your physical descendants, but all nations, all peoples will be blessed through you. All those who put their faith in the Savior, that promised offspring, that head crusher, they will be blessed. They will be saved. Jesus is that sacrificed, sacrificed lamb, now brought back to life. The one who now rules in heaven, and this is why in the book of Revelation that so often tells us about what is coming, it pictures that lamb and it repeats that over and over, that term for Jesus. He is the lamb of God. In Revelation 5, we hear in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Seven. This wonderful number for God. The Lamb, Jesus, deserves all praise because He delivered us from sin and death as the sacrificial Lamb. Tonight, we remember why. Why Jesus sacrificed Himself. Tonight is called Maundy Thursday. Maundy comes from that Latin term meaning command. Tonight, about or on a Thursday evening, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus is celebrating Passover meal with his disciples. 
And we hear in John 13, Jesus say, A new command I give you, love. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It was Jesus' love. It was his love that brought him to sacrifice himself. It was his love that brought him to take on flesh, to put himself under the law. It was his love that saved you. That Thursday night, because of his love, he did not just give the disciples a lamb to eat. Because of his great love that night, he gave him his own flesh and blood for them to eat for the forgiveness of their sins. Not a lamb to remind them of a deliverance that was good just in this world. Not a lamb that would simply satisfy their physical need for sustenance, but his own body and blood. We read in our gospel, reading from Luke 22, and he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to this to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This new covenant. It's explained in our New Testament reading from Hebrews 10. <clears throat> The Holy Spirit also testifies to about this. First, he says, this is the covenant. The covenant, the promise, the agreement, the guarantee. I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Gone. Forgotten. Erased. Not bringing them up again. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Because of Jesus, no more lambs. None. Because of Jesus, there is true forgiveness, a payment for sin. Your sins, your guilt, not remembered by God, ever. And then a few verses later in Hebrews 10, we see the result of all this, the new covenant that God has put His law in our minds and our hearts, that He has filled us with faith and His Spirit, really that He has filled us with love. We see what it means to show love to one another and to the next generation. Continuing in Hebrews 10, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, gathering or congregating would be a fine definition. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The day the Lamb of God will return is approaching. It gets closer and closer every day. And God wants you and the next generation to remember the Lamb who delivered us from our sins and death, who has saved us from hell. Gathering is one way to show love. This command, this mandate, Monday, Thursday, gathering together, encouraging one another, this shows love for one another. As we gather to remember the Lamb, our Savior, Jesus. Now, as you gather together, it's good then to have that next generation with us so that they hear. So that they hear and they can remember the Lamb of God. Now, if you look in your bulletin on page 12, if you're wondering what questions could we ask, they're right there. And if you're wondering what are the answers to those questions, you can look on page 23. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you know the answers to those questions, but I did print them for you. If you're wondering how, how would I show love to the next generation, whether they're your kid or not, whether your kid's 72 or two and a half, these questions, though simple, are true for all of us. These questions reveal the great deliverance of God. Teach them, teach them to the next generation. They can answer questions. What's your favorite animal? They know. Even from a young age, they know. They can answer questions. 
You can teach them. Now, God doesn't tell us his favorite animal, but I tell you what, I'd be willing to bet it's a lamb. This evening is Monday, Thursday. It's named for Jesus' command to love. He loved us by becoming that sacrificial lamb, died on the cross, replaced you on the cross for your sins. You are forgiven. It's done. There is no more need for sacrifice. He has opened the door to heaven. You are his people. You are no longer required then to put lamb's blood in the door frames of your home. Instead, he gave you his body and blood to eat and to drink. Remember the lamb who has delivered you. And love the next generation. Love them by teaching them to remember the Lamb. Amen. Service will continue on page 13. We're joined to confess our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You can take a moment. At some point, fill out the connection cards in the back of the pew in front of you. There's a place there also for any prayer requests or any feedback in the service. You can also use the QR code on the front of the worship folder as well. We'll join then on page 14 in our responses and prayer. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let them turn to the Lord, and He will have mercy on them. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Lord, as we remember you as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, let us teach the next generation so that they also remember you and put their trust in your deliverance. Hear us now as we join together to pray, and we'll pray slowly so the next generation can join with us. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins, and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Join to sing the next hymn, hymn 742, What is this bread? <laughs> 